Tonight, a fractured G7. Your allies pressure you to give up the trade war with China. The uh, respect the trade war has to happen. They're meant to debate the world's most pressing issues, but these leaders showed up with plenty of their own baggage. Coming to a consensus wasn't even an option. Protests in Hong Kong erupt into violence again as police unleash new weapons and gunfire. Our Chris Brown is in the middle of it all. Go back to China where you belong. And a video of a racist tirade prompts angry backlash online. But why people reacting to the video could be in more trouble than the woman herself. This is The National. Think of what's happening in southern France this weekend as part politics, part diplomatic tightrope walking act. World leaders are meeting for the G7 summit on paper to talk about global issues like gender inequality and climate change, but also there, tension, disagreement, and high stakes. Why? Because in coming together to tackle the world's problems, so many of these leaders brought their own along too. Canada's Justin Trudeau has an election right around the corner. Britain's Boris Johnson has an October 31st Brexit deadline breathing down his neck. And then U.S. President Donald Trump, around whom so much of the tension swirls. He's in the middle of a trade war with China that's affecting the entire world's economy. And don't forget, he too has an election coming up next year. So working around Donald Trump has changed how this summit works at all. David Cochran is in Biarritz, France, and explains how. Justin Trudeau arrives at this G7 as a great defender of multilateral institutions. Donald Trump as a great disruptor. From those different starting points, they seek common ground. Canadian and American economy are doing well, partially because of the uh, uh, trading relationship we have. So we're going to be significantly expanding our trading relationship when the USMCA gets done and completed. Uh, our farmers love it. The unions love it. As neighbors and largest trading partners, they need to keep this relationship positive. But the strains at this summit are showing. American media reports cite anonymous U.S. officials complaining that France is wasting too much time on climate change, gender equality, and development in Africa, calling them niche issues. Trump wants to focus on boosting the economy, even though his escalating trade war with China has slowed growth, sent markets tumbling, and made allies nervous. Though Trump doesn't quite see it that way. Mr. President, are your allies pressuring you to give up the trade war with China? No, no, no. I haven't heard them. I think they uh, respect the trade war. Just to register the faint sheep-like note of uh, our, our view on the, on the trade war, we're in favor of trade peace on, on the whole. But trade peace isn't Trump's style, and that style is changing the way the G7 works. His stance on climate change, for instance, has forced leaders to abandon the idea of a unanimous communique when this summit is over. Historically, leaders sit at this table to tackle the world's biggest challenges. Now, one of those challenges is sitting with them. At Trump's first G7 in Italy, he broke the consensus on climate by making it clear he was pulling out of the Paris Agreement. At his second last year in Quebec, he obliterated the communique in a tweet storm from Air Force One. Now in France, they won't even try to forge a consensus. Next year, Trump is scheduled to host. <laughs> So rather than work in a group of seven, they work in groups of ones and twos and threes to make progress on what they can, when they can. Trudeau continues to meet with like-minded leaders on climate and trade. He supports the African development agenda put forward by France. The goal is to show that multilateral organizations can be effective in difficult times. Of course, Trudeau also wants to show that he can be effective in difficult times. That's certainly a message he wants to send to the other world leaders here at this summit, but also to Canadians back home, especially with an election in October. David Cochran, CBC News, Biarritz, France. And there was a major summit surprise today. Iran's foreign minister flew in for some sideline diplomacy with the French president. As Alan Morrow tells us, the White House claims it was blindsided. 
Iran's foreign minister Javad Zarif tweeted these photos, all smiles at his unannounced meeting with Emmanuel Macron. Cette discussion sur les rangs. The entire G7 is committed to the stability and peace of the region, the French president said. But there was confusion over who knew Macron invited Zarif. Even Donald Trump had little or perhaps no notice. I can't stop people from talking. If they want to talk, they can talk. The U.S. is isolated. It pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal its G7 partners desperately want to save. If nothing happens to prevent escalation, German Chancellor Angela Merkel said, then we have to fear Iran will renege even further. Iran upped its uranium enrichment, breaking the deal's limits to get back at the U.S. Weeks of tensions in the Strait of Hormuz this summer, attacks on oil tankers, a downed U.S. drone, each side blaming the other. Who's the source of instability in the region? The answer to all these questions would not be Iran. Macron seemingly wants to mediate, betting on Trump's desire to be the deal maker in chief. Perhaps looking to Trump's meetings with Kim Jong un and hoping for the same with Iran. But Trump so far isn't biting, tweeting earlier this month, I know Emmanuel means well, but nobody speaks for the United States but the United States itself. Iran is also refusing to back down, unveiling a new missile system just last week. Caught in the middle, the country's civilians struggling under U.S. sanctions. This family can't get the right medicine for their child who has cancer. The human cost of a conflict that seems far from over. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Now, on those fires burning in the Amazon, we told you on Friday about French President Emmanuel Macron's call to make them a top G7 priority. Well, one of the few things they agreed on this weekend was the beginnings of a plan. At least 41,000 wildfires have sparked in the world's largest rainforest this year, leading to global outrage and calls to act. Brazil's president has faced plenty of criticism for policies that can be linked to deforestation, but he has authorized tens of thousands of soldiers to help battle those fires. Today, Macron says G7 leaders are working on providing both technical and financial help. Germany also plans to talk with Brazil about reforestation once the flames are under control. Experts believe most of the fires are being set by farmers deliberately to clear land. Okay, to Hong Kong now. And a flashpoint between a pro-democracy protest movement and a government ultimately answerable to Beijing that seems as explosive as ever. Any hope that the unrest in Hong Kong was reaching a more peaceful phase was shattered over the past 24 hours. Sunday's protests began peacefully enough, with marchers gathering in a park in the city's outskirts. But near that demonstration, a hardcore group was girding for battle. So were police. And what our reporter on the ground, Chris Brown, witnessed with his own eyes was a dramatic escalation. Hong Kong streets turned white again as tear gas that burns the skin coated protesters who refused to take down street barricades. When that didn't work, police rolled out new weapons. Water cannons mounted on armored vehicles. All of that ratcheted up the intensity of the violence here, but what we saw on a side street in Kowloon was arguably worse. Riot police confronted what they thought was a small group of protesters. But suddenly, from around a corner, more people showed up and went on the attack. In the rain-soaked streets amongst the chaos, one cop stumbled and fell, and for an instant, it seemed he might be swarmed and beaten. Then, in one of the few times since these protests started, police drew their guns. One fired a warning shot. Others waved their guns at the crowd, including in our direction, as one brave man tried to de-escalate things. And this is where that very scary scene ended, with the riot police taking shelter in this building here. A few minutes later, as you can see, dozens, perhaps scores, of reinforcements came banging on their shields 
to relieve them, but a very scary moment. People here have given up counting the number of rounds of tear gas that have been fired and the number of nights of clashes between police and protesters. Authorities have tried shutting down metro stations so people can't get to the protests, and Chinese regulators have put pressure on Hong Kong companies to ensure their employees stay away, but none of that appears to be working. After a short lull in the violence last week, Sunday night's confrontations were arguably among the worst since Hong Kong's political crisis began. Chris Brown, CBC News, Hong Kong. Now the fear is where this goes next, because eventually one side is going to have to back down, and the stakes are only going up. We need democracy. We need real election. We need democracy. Beijing can't be seen surrendering control to a pro-democracy movement anywhere in its territory. Hence, the show of force last week, with Chinese paramilitary exercises just outside Hong Kong. But crushing the protests would also carry risks. China doesn't want the way that they handle the Hong Kong issue to be kind of an item in the trade disputes with uh, uh, the United States. So this is what China wants the world to see. Violence, vandalism. But of course, there are also the hundreds of thousands who continue to demonstrate peacefully. So actually it put them in a kind of a very difficult situation because uh, it, the persistence of the protests and the mix of uh, peaceful and uh, more violent means. Sustaining some of the protesters is a sense that they're in too deep to back down. I think some of them had kind of an end game mentality because they think that if they failed this time, then uh, Hong Kong will be finished in terms of freedom, in terms of uh, they may face massive arrests. Indeed, some Hong Kongers fear they're working against a deadline. In October, the People's Republic of China marks its 70th anniversary, and the thinking is Beijing will want the crisis resolved before then, one way or another. Well, with just eight weeks to go until the federal election here in Canada, Maxime Bernier kicked off his campaign as leader of the People's Party of Canada. Now, a key plank of his platform, cutting what he calls mass immigration. Controversial, for sure. But as Sarah Levitt reports, some of his supporters aren't shy about spreading that very message right across the country. The billboards have popped up along highways across Canada. Say no to mass immigration, vote People's Party. Launching his campaign from his Quebec riding today, Maxime Bernier defended the billboards. We want fewer immigrants, a maximum of 150,000 a year. And, you know, we're not for mass immigration. The billboards were put up by a third party called True North Strong and Free Advertising Corporation. Bernier tweeted that his party has no connection to the group, but that the billboards do accurately represent his stance on immigration. For me, mass immigration, it's 350,000 a year. If you look at it, after three years, that would be a million new Canadians, and it's the equivalent of the population of Nova Scotia. Bernier points to the Quebec election. Coalition Avenir Quebec leader François Legault successfully ran on a campaign promise to temporarily reduce the number of immigrants. Bernier says many other Canadians want to have a similar discussion. As for those billboards, there has been criticism. Nova Scotia's Liberal Premier Stephen McNeil tweeted, As Premier, I welcome everyone to Nova Scotia, but I don't welcome this negative, divisive tone. Bernier says it's not negative at all. So we need to go back, we need to have fewer immigrants, but we need to be sure that these people would be able to integrate our society, to be part of our society. Tonight, the billboard company said while the ads met its standards, it's been inundated with complaints. It was never my or Patterson Outdoors' intention to offend, alienate or insult the public by letting this ad to be run. The company says the billboards will be taken down as soon as possible. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. And a reminder about one of the tools CBC News has for you this election season. Our poll tracker is an aggregate of major public polls crunched by our very own polls analyst Eric Grenier. And here's where things stand right now. Starting with Bernier's People's Party, which is sitting at just under 3%. Up at the top, the Conservatives lead the Liberals by a little more than a percentage point, pretty neck and neck. The NDP are at about 14%, and the Greens at around 10
Be sure to keep up with how it all shifts around as we get closer and closer to election night. You can head to cbcnews.ca slash poll tracker. Okay, here are some of the other stories we're watching this Sunday night on The National. He is just seeking some closure in this situation. The father of suspected killer Briar Schmigelski says he wants to see the video his son recorded before he died. Al Schmigelski calls it a last will and testament. The RCMP isn't willing to hand it over, but has shared some information about the video with Schmigelski's mother, who was listed as her, as her son's next of kin. I wish I could just go there and take their pain away, but I can't, so this is my only way of helping them out. People gathered in several Canadian cities today to mark a somber anniversary. Exactly two years ago, Myanmar began expelling more than 700,000 Rohingya. To mark the milestone today, huge crowds of refugees protested in camps across Bangladesh. This has a little bit more meaning for me personal, personally, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson taking part in his first Pride Parade since coming out a week ago. Watson says he waited 40 years to publicly reveal he's gay and that he's been touched by all the support he's received since. Okay, to British Columbia now, where a racist rant in a parking lot has prompted a police investigation and some pretty major online backlash against the woman at the center of it. But as Tanya Fletcher explains, that reaction could end up being just as problematic as the rant itself. You don't know a damn thing. Go back to China where you belong. Yeah. A disturbing encounter caught on camera in the middle of a parking lot. You crossed the line. I crossed the line. China lady. The video shows two cars with their front bumpers touching. The woman targeted in the tirade says she just finished shopping with her three-year-old daughter. She just asked where uh, I'm coming from. I said, this is not the point. I think the thing is that we got an accident here, but she just, you know, refused to listen to me and started yelling. I was so mad because, you know, uh, my, my kid was frightened. The confrontation happened in this strip mall parking lot. CBC News spoke with the woman seen yelling in the video. She refused an interview but says she makes no apologies for her comments and doesn't regret the language she used. Now, as for RCMP, they confirm they are investigating, but they won't specify what possible charges could be laid. So the Supreme Court of Canada has ruled in a number of cases about what constitutes hate speech. Kyla Lee is a criminal lawyer. She says hate crime charges are possible but not common in cases like this. So they have to prove in these cases that the person made the speech in order to incite or promote hatred, which means that it has to be more of a public expression. So private discourse between individuals doesn't necessarily rise to the level of hate speech. Charges of causing a disturbance could be considered as well. But there's another group of people that could also be in legal trouble. This follows a predictable pattern. The video has prompted thousands of social media comments naming and shaming the woman, some publicly posting her personal information as soon as you say, here's this person's address, here's this person's phone number, it's foreseeable that others are going to use that information to either cause harm or to cause distress. And you could be charged with counseling people to commit a criminal offense. Others who've gone so far as to post death threats on the woman's Facebook page could be charged too. Ultimately, Lee says it's likely there would be charges related to the response far sooner than charges related to the incident itself. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Richmond. And lots more still to come on tonight's National, including the Canadian who exposed the Cambridge Analytica scandal. We will revisit Ian's interview with Christopher Wiley. But next, what a research project on Ebola can tell us about fighting the anti-vax movement in Canada. We know that when these messages are spread in mom groups or at the park, that they can actually be extremely influential as well. There are uh, negative social media campaigns, people who've tried to convince um, populations that the vaccine is used to infect you and the therapeutics are used to finish you off. That's the World Health Organization explaining some of the challenges in containing the second deadliest outbreak of Ebola on record. There is a proven life-saving vaccine, but convincing people to take it hasn't been easy. So far, the outbreak has claimed nearly 2,000 lives. There are signs of a turnaround, though. 
More than 200,000 people in the Democratic Republic of Congo were immunized this month alone. And as Katie Nicholson explains, the same approach used to deal with anti-vaccine sentiment in Africa could be useful here. Those last few days of summer vacation, when Mallory Olszewski doesn't have to worry about sending her son Riley to school. The school is kind of a, a cesspool, if you will, um, for these eradicated diseases when children don't vaccinate. So sending him to school is very scary for us. Riley is immunocompromised and can't get certain vaccines, which makes him vulnerable to serious illness if other parents choose not to vaccinate their kids. It's everywhere. And then, you know, some moms won't vaccinate and then other moms won't vaccinate because this mom didn't. Take the MMR shot, which prevents measles, mumps and rubella. In order to prevent outbreaks, 95% of the population needs to get the shot. In Toronto, only 92% of school-aged children have been vaccinated. In Ottawa, only 94% of seven-year-olds have been immunized. That puts kids like Riley at risk. To get those numbers up, public health officials here are looking for guidance on how to combat medical mistrust. And the answer could come from half a world away, where Canadian researchers are helping people in Congo grapple with Ebola. There's a sense of mistrust. Right? Rumors are going around right, about that, oh, the vaccine is actually, you get injected with the virus, right? Or that it's a government conspiracy. York uh, University professor Harris Ali is part of a team taking on Ebola in Congo by enlisting people who live there. It's open to all the, the community leaders, whoever they may be. It's an approach that has had great success in the Ebola outbreak in Liberia several years ago earn the trust of the people, sometimes by addressing simple pre-existing needs in the community, like fresh water by building wells. This trust helps them draw in leaders who are already respected. Those leaders are then educated about the disease and deputized to help track it in their own community. Because oftentimes uh, there's some arrogance in the response that, okay, you know, we in the West know better. Um, you know, there's no sort of attention to the local knowledge, to the local practices. A successful response to Ebola will only occur if there's community engagement. Okay? Without that, it will be a failure. There's no question that that kind of an intervention could definitely have an impact here in Canada. Dr. Vanina Dubé says 20% of Canadian parents are on the fence about vaccinations. She thinks creating vaccination ambassadors in school and parent groups could inoculate parents against vaccination misinformation. So we know that when these messages are spread in mom groups or at the park, that they can actually be extremely influential as well. In Ottawa, Mallory Olszewski agrees. I think a lot of the times when doctors come out and really push for things they believe in, it's admirable and it's, it's definitely something that they should do. Um, but it doesn't hold as much weight as a mom who has a little girl or a little boy who has been vaccinated. An approach she's already taking, as... one mom at a time. <gasps> Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. And coming up on tonight's National, a story from the front lines of the robot revolution. Your martini is made by machine. But next, the Canadian who blew the lid off what Facebook is really doing with your data. They want to take the data, they want to monetize you and make money off of you, but when there's a problem, they want to push it to something else and say it's really complicated. Ian's interview with the central figure in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, right after this. We give social media companies our personal information, our photos, our connections, our politics. And for a long time, very few people thought twice about that. But Clearly, that's not the case anymore. We now know just how easily our own information can be used to manipulate us. Christopher Wiley is part of the reason why. Last year, he blew the whistle on personal Facebook data being shared with a political consulting firm called Cambridge Analytica. So now, with our own federal election just two months away, we revisit a conversation he had with Ian. He was relatively unknown just over a year ago. But now, in some circles, Christopher Wiley is practically a household name. 
the data scientist who blew the lid off the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, a breach that affected 87 million people. Personal information was harvested, and it was used to profile people on Facebook with political messages and disinformation. Campaigns that many believe influenced the 2016 U.S. election and the Brexit vote. I think it is completely reasonable to say that there could have been a different outcome in the referendum, you know, had there not been, in my view, cheating. The revelation set off a media firestorm, and suddenly, Facebook seemed vulnerable. In the months that followed, Wiley has become much more than a whistleblower, but almost an evangelist for limiting the power of big tech companies like Facebook, calling for regulations, a code of ethics for software engineers, and of course, making sure all of us who use social media and tech are aware of the risks. I caught up with Christopher Wiley recently in Vancouver. Hey, well, so thank you very much for doing this. Thanks for having and me. And it's really interesting to finally see you in person. I feel like I know you because I've seen so much of you over the last year. But uh... And vice versa. When I was growing up, I watched you on CB2. Excellent. So there we go. We finally meet. That's right. Yeah. You have been at the forefront of this awakening, really, in the last 13 months. How much safer are things now than they were a year ago? I wouldn't... I wouldn't say that things are safer, per se. I think that there's more awareness. Um, so, you know, the way I think about it um, is that a lot of these platforms, despite the fact that they talk about themselves as services, with terms and conditions and opt-ins, they're not. They're architectures. In other domains where infrastructure is at play, whether that's a physical architecture or, you know, an energy infrastructure, water infrastructure, we don't talk about um, you know, what, personal responsibility there. We talk about is what's being built safe, right? And so what I feel like you know, has happened with Facebook is that they've built an architecture without fire exits, right? With faulty wiring. And instead they've just said, well, we're gonna put some terms and conditions on the door and let people walk in and just call it our user experience. And so I think that we really need to start having a conversation about are the architectures that are being built, are they safe? Like the, the reality is that just like how electricity is absolutely essential to the functioning of a person in modern society, using the internet also is. And so people don't actually have a choice as to whether to opt in or opt out. Because if you, if you, if you say to a person, all right, well, if you want to protect your you know, human rights, your privacy rights, don't use the internet. I mean, it's like saying if you don't want to be electrocuted, don't use buildings. And what I'm saying is that currently these big tech platforms do not want to take responsibility. They want to take the data, they want to monetize you and make money off of you, but when there's a problem, they want to push it to something else and say it's really complicated. And for me, when I hear that, I, I hear you know, a company like Boeing say, yeah, well, aerospace engineering is really complicated and sometimes their planes fall out of the sky. Right? We would not tolerate that. So, you know, for me, Facebook's defense is the best argument to say why we should be regulating them, because it is complicated. So we need to ensure that they, they perform due diligence on their products before they release them to the public. So if the government of Canada came to you, and maybe they have, um, and said, how do we do this properly? Because, you know, part of this too is uh, the internet and social media can give voice to people in a good way. Completely. It can, it can uh, you know, break down barriers and, and allow freedom of expression. And presumably you don't want to uh, restrict that unnecessarily. So what, what is it that needs to be regulated? I think that actually one of the, the best places to start is actually not just imposing regulations on social media companies, but actually creating professional conduct standards for engineers and architects who work in software and data science, where people and professionals are not only obligated to constantly question themselves and the technologies that they're building about how it can go wrong or how it could be misused or what its impact is going to be on public health or public safety or democracy, but also empower people who see things happening inside of these companies before they're actually built and empower them to say, no, actually, this is unethical, and empower them where they can't be retaliated against. Let's talk about the consumers, the users, the, 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 the people out there who are embracing social media. Yeah. I sense that some people 
ha feel paranoid about social media now. Uh, certainly many people feel anxious. Is that how people should be feeling, the, the users of social media? I think skeptical um, and questioning um, you know, are healthy things. Um, I, I think what's important for people to really start thinking about is not just what's happening right now, but what is the trends um, of these big tech companies and where that might end up in 5, 10, 20 years from now. So when you look at patent applications from Google or from Facebook or Amazon, where, you, where they want to design essentially surveillance networks inside of physical constructed space, right, including in your living room, where for the first time in human history, you are sitting in your own house and you are never alone because the ambient environment is watching you thinking about you and constantly trying to seek to change, influence, and optimize your behavior. And if, if we put people in an environment where their house thinks about them and constantly talks to an ad network, and that ad network also talks to their children's toys, and that it talks to your car, and your car decides whether or not you should be on time for work depending on the subscription package that you have for the self-driving features of that car, mm -hmm. where your refrigerator starts buying things for you, right? Where all of a sudden you become completely infantilized um, in your life because everything around you is thinking about you and seeking to change and influence your behavior. And I feel like that could go terribly, terribly wrong. Are there clear do's and don'ts right now? Um, when you have purchased or subscribed to a smart device, service, software, platform, etc., understand that those things are often interconnected and that what they do now is not necessarily how they want to monetize it five, ten years from now, right? So when you look at things like genetic tests and, you know, ancestry mm -hmm. tests and all of that, you know, it might be fun to see, you know, genetically where you're from in the world, but at the same time, Take a step back and go, what happens if this gets integrated with an insurance company, for example, if you're in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what if, what if this gets integrated with some other kind of consumer credit profiling, right? What happens when, actually, I haven't even used this test, but my cousin has, and an insurance company then acquires that company and then profiles me via what my cousin did, right? And all of a sudden, it, and this is what I'm saying, is that it's actually a really hard and insidious problem because even if you do not use a lot of these platforms or services, they still can profile you and seek to influence you. And so the thing that I would say is that if people are concerned about where we're going with technology, call your MP and tell them about it. Or call Facebook and tell them about it. Just tell the people who are actually making or responsible or in power to change it that you don't like where we're going. So given everything you've experienced and seen, the good and bad, in the last year or so, do you actually think calling Facebook and or calling your MP will make a difference? Well, it, if, if we say that you know, public pressure on companies and politicians doesn't work, then we've got a bigger problem, right? Um, then we're saying, you know, our whole democratic process doesn't work. So I think that people need to try, um, you know. So you're optimistic. I, I'm sensing some optimism here. I, I'm, I have to be optimistic. If I'm not optimistic, we're heading to a really terrible place, right? Have you seen the movie WALL-E? No. So in WALL-E, you've got a robot that gets sent to Earth it's the Pixar movie, and Earth is destroyed because of climate change. And all these people now live in spaceships, and they live in these little customized entertainment pods. And they're these sort of blob-like humans that have become infantilized because, you know, computers just show them stuff all day. Mm -hmm. Make a place, grief, jealous, no, it does sound Look, I'm tired of it. And I worry that that's our future. We've completely eviscerated the environment, and we've completely infantilized humans. Okay, now you don't sound optimistic. And so what I'm saying is that, you know, as cute as a movie Wally is, if you think about it, is that the future that we want? And so, you know, we need to take a step back and go, if we don't want that, if you don't want your children or your grandchildren to live in that kind of environment, you've got to speak up because it's the only thing that you can do, right? Um, it, 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 I think it would be unreasonable to say that people should stop using 
all Facebook, uh, Instagram, Google, whatever services, because it's going to be impossible to be a functioning person in modern society. So we've got to put public pressure on and change the, the, the actual way we talk about these platforms. It's not these amazing things, but actually with a more skeptical eye and say, actually, what are you trying to do? What are you planning on doing five years from now? Why are you taking out all these patents? But this is the brilliant thing about a democracy, is that if people mobilize and put pressure on politicians, they eventually will respond. This is how the civil rights movement works. This is how a lot of social change works. So you know, it can be as simple as calling up your MP. OK, you sound optimistic again, and you also sound fascinating. Thank you very Cheers. much. It's fantastic. Thanks. OK, just ahead, the robot revolution. They've jumped from the assembly line to the coffee line. The kind of basic functionality of making drinks is done by a robot. So that is one of the things that makes it more economical for us to like scale really quickly. Could you be unemployed by a droid? But first. In case you missed it, shock in the NFL after star Indianapolis Colts quarterback Andrew Luck suddenly announced he's retiring. Fans did not take it well. And now you're starting to hear the reaction of some of the fans. It almost, Jimmy, yeah. it sounds like some of these fans are booing. A bit about Luck. He was drafted first overall just seven years ago. Some called him a generational quarterback, but those boos, now the cap on a career cut short. Yeah, it hurt. I'll be honest, chap. It hurt. Just another layer to his pain. The 29-year-old has been dealing with injuries for years. His shoulder, his leg, a concussion, even a lacerated kidney. The list goes on. Luck's explanation for leaving got emotional. It's taken my joy of this game away. Uh, and uh, this... Sorry. Guys have been healthy and retired early, not because they were hurt, but because as a matter of preventive care. Sports writer Drew McGarry says it's not the injuries to blame, it's the league. And it's raising questions about the brutality of the game. Even though the NFL has acknowledged far, far too late the damaging effects of the sport, they're not going to fundamentally alter the inherent violence of the sport. And players know that. So what could Lux retirement mean for the future of football? will become more acceptable for more players to walk away. They're not going to stop the talent pool from draining, and it's going to make for a crummy product. We'll see if that initial shock turns to soul searching within the NFL. Well, they may look like they belong to the Jetsons, but the latest generation of robots can free you from the mundane. Plus, they're friendly, efficient, and getting smarter. But as Kim Brunhuber showed us a few months ago, the consequences can be hard to predict. Who loses jobs and which industries are vulnerable when employers go automated? At this Los Angeles hotel, a guest just called for room service. She wants a ginger ale. So the front desk clerk summons the bellhop, Wally. At only three feet tall, he's a model employee works 24-7 with no breaks for free. Wally is, of course, a robot, programmed to interact with guests and to deliver things to rooms. Hi, Wally. Latasha McDowell says it's like having R2-D2 show up at your door. All set. And he doesn't expect a tip. What do you think? This is very cool. I love it. <laughs> Yay! Wally is a service robot, loosely defined as a robot that performs useful tasks for humans in a non-industrial setting, like a home or a store. A recent study by a Washington think tank suggested automation will threaten a quarter of U.S. jobs. This has many workers wondering, will a robot replacement be coming for them? And the irony is you would think because the robots, it would be cheaper, but the drinks are actually twice as expensive. So. If you were a fan of the Tom Green show, you might recognize Phil Giroux as Green's former sidekick, now a director with an Ottawa-based IT company. He and a couple of colleagues came to this Las Vegas bar for a drink. Here at the Tipsy Robot, the two bartenders can't listen to your troubles, but they will mix your drink in 90 seconds or less. Cheers, everyone, to the future uh, robot drinks. 
But seeing this technology at work for the first time, Giroux fears the future is bleak for many in the service sector. If you're in the uh, bartending industry, look out. The bar's general manager says human bartenders needn't worry. This robot isn't a threat. It's not going to take jobs because they cannot still work without human. We still need human to just to make sure that everything is going okay. For instance, these bartenders need humans to change their bottles, but already the company is working on a new model that can solve many of these challenges. And these rapid advances in robotic technology could have profound implications for the labor force. Some people say this is a bit like walking a dog. David Crawley is the founder of a robotics company that designed Magni. The robot has a neural net which is a little bit like a human brain. Find person. And it's just found you and it's driving up to you. This robot is like a building block that can be easily modified to do different jobs. A robotic porter, for instance. Or a robot cocktail waiter. Crawley says the technology is advancing so quickly, robots could eventually be doing a lot of the work Canadians are doing now. As a roboticist, I, that would be my, my wildest fantasy. You're, you're rooting for the robot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rooting for the robot, right? You know, I mean, they're able to move things from one place to another. They're able to interact with objects and do the sorts of things that, that humans can do. And, you know, that's going to displace human work. You know, receptionists, secretaries, people that, that do things in offices are going to be the, the next area that I think robots are going to displace. On a street corner in San Francisco, Cafe X, the only coffee shop in America run by a robot. It's a very friendly robot. It has like a, several different dance routines. <laughs> the robot's young inventor says employees can focus on customers instead of the boring task of actually making the coffee. But in an unusually frank admission, he concedes by using robots, the business is able to reduce one of its highest costs. Certainly it gives us uh, the flexibility to sort of adjust the amount of labor we have on site because, you know, the kind of basic functionality of making drinks is done by a robot. So that is one of the things that makes it more economical for us to like scale really quickly. Researchers suggest in 20 years, roughly 90% of jobs in the food preparation industry could be done by robots. Is this the future? Uh, I think it's pretty obvious it is, yeah. Back at this Los Angeles hotel, Wally has finished his deliveries. Need anything? Dial zero from your room, it'll bring it to you. Right now, Wally and many other service robots aren't actually vital to the bottom line, more like a novelty to draw customers. Hashtag Wally. <laughs> Chances are you will eventually have a robotic colleague at work, but it's unlikely you will actually be replaced anytime soon. After all, customers still need human interaction, and robots still need us. For now. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Just ahead, Toronto's Fan Expo, known for its extravagant costumes, but who are you going to call when that cape suddenly rips? So many talented people with such amazing artistic uh, skill, and they apply the, the, those skill into beautiful things. When your superpower is sewing, our moment is next. It is Fan Expo Weekend in Toronto, and that means amazing people watching. Lots of folks are decked out in elaborate costumes, paying homage to video games, comics, movies. They are out in full force downtown and appreciate the fact that these costumes, they can take days, weeks, or even months to get ready. And yet, after even all that effort, the occasional wardrobe malfunction can still happen. Enter Wayne Du. He's a self-described costume medic, He's attending the expo this weekend, armed with a glue gun, duct tape, and other mending tools. He takes calls from distressed cosplayers, rushing to help, and his craft is tonight's moment. My right arm here needs to be here, and here came off here. And do you have a wipe or something? Yes, I do. Awesome, thank you. I got my uh, armors ripping off, and someone lent me the sewing kit. And that is actually inspired me to do to be cosplay medic for the con after that. I can go up and meet you, okay? How long do you want it and go on uh, to? Just a, like, it's sort of vain, like, down to there. Okay. 
to see their smile of relief when they see that they can continue to have fun on, on the con floor and to uh, show up the cosplay. It, it's, it's really nice. It I cannot good. explain it, but it feels nice to have people. Yes. I mean, I guess a Canadian thing to say. There's so many talented people with such amazing artistic uh, skill, and they apply the, the, those skills into beautiful things. And it's great to see a favorite character come to life. <laughs> and you know what? I'm with Wayne 100%. I know there are a lot of people out there who turn their noses up at cosplayers. They think it's silly, but hey, I think it's fun. It is creative. And anyone who has fun helping other people have fun, they're okay in my book. So Wayne, do keep doing what you're doing. That's The National for this Sunday, August 25th. Have a good night.